and you know more uh, very often you know i uh, tend to think that i should go through this chapter because i have to be thoroughly acquainted thoroughly conversant with this disorder but i don't get time because of our you know uh, patient load work burden and also at the same time you know the core elements of rheumatology uh, you know are also quite vast and they are continuously changing so we have to keep up with them so i can't pay attention to the non core that is that is peripheral uh, elements of rheumatology for example this diffuse parenchymal lung disease associated with rheumatic diseases so i had great interest and that's why when uh, dr ehsan jawan approached me to uh, you know to participate th in this session i agreed with uh, i should say great happiness great pleasure or other rather i can say with great ecstasy and when i learned that you know uh, professor dj christopher will be speaking i have very good impression about the teachers of christian medical college in velour they are very competent highly knowledgeable and so i got you know very much ecstatic that you know uh, without much uh, you know labor i shall be learning about this dpld one of my long cherished topics so uh, now actually about professor dj christopher dr ehsanul jaman manna has told something and i think you know actually uh, about uh, dj christopher we can say many things but simply that will occupy or that will uh, squeeze his time for talking so i am not going into the details of you know of the credentials of dj christopher i rather invite dj christopher to start giving his talk please thank you professor atikul haq uh, uh, good evening to all of you it's a pleasure to meet you on this virtual platform uh, we are linked by the fact that our countries are friendly nations we have historical connections and more importantly my institution christian medical college velour is a favorite place for some of your patients so every almost every outpatient day we would see at least one patient from bangladesh so that is the connection we have and uh, you know we uh, see your prescriptions and uh, we we appreciate your feedback and notes and it helps a great deal in us making our diagnosis and i hope in turn the advice we give also helps you to manage the patients when they come back home uh, so it really gives me great pleasure to have been invited uh, by dr e hasan and team uh, i i mean i don't think anybody will envy my position because this is the first lecture i am giving i have chaired two sessions uh, and this is the most difficult area for even uh, pulmonary physicians leave alone general physicians and others it is it is quite difficult even for us but i am sure uh, uh, you will find it even more difficult to even understand what this is so i have a very challenging job to try and make you understand many of you are not respiratory physicians uh, and you come from other specialties and probably general medicine and maybe even general practice so it is a challenge i will try to do what i can i really wish i had an easier topic at least the first time around but i will do what i can and uh, professor atihul haq is a good friend of dr dabashish danda who is my close friend and he has told me a lot about him it's a pleasure to share this podium along with him okay let's dive deep into this topic uh, interstitial lung disease people often call it ild for short uh, is also called diffuse parenchymal lung disease dpld Uh, so don't get lost in these short forms if you are used to saying ild just keep saying that that is good enough it is defined as diffuse parenchymal diseases obviously of the lung which are of heterogeneous 
distinct lung disorders classified on the grounds of shared clinical radiographic physiologic or pathologic factors so we have to understand this definition they are a group of heterogeneous disorders ild or interstitial lung disease is not one disease it is a group of disorders and in fact the definition says they are distinctive lung disorders each one has its own uh, type of presentation response to treatment and so on and so forth but they are classified together because they have shared clinical radiologic physiologic and pathologic factors so this is the classification of dpld or ild so if you see here you have uh, let me change the pointer just give me a moment so that i can change my pointer but your screen has not been shared oh so sorry i am so sorry i thought i have shared my screen okay so this is the definition i gave you so i think uh, i explained this to you so hopefully you have caught on it's a group of heterogeneous disorders but they share clinical radiographic pathologic uh, factors now let me get my pointer uh, okay so this is the classification so ild or dpld is divided into dpld of known cause so such as drugs rheumatic diseases dr atihul hak was talking about it a lot of rheumatological diseases present with lung manifestation so we know the cause the second category which is by and far the most enigmatic and uh, challenging is the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias as the term suggests idiopathic means we do not have a known cause and therefore this will be a diagnosis of exclusion then we have granulomatous disorders example sarcoidosis uh, granulomatous because if you biopsy the appropriate tissue you would see granulomas and there are other disorders like lamp PL, plch and so on for today we will forget about them we have enough of our plates looking at all these things to this also i want to add uh, among the known causes will also be pneumoconiosis that is occupational lung disorders they also come in this category so uh, among these if the so let us come to this one i was telling you that this is the more enigmatic one idiopathic interstitial pneumonia of this idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the most important it is the prototype when we describe interstitial lung disease we will describe idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and then we will say the other things are different in the following ways so when often when we say ild we are talking about this okay so i i am not going to spend too much time on that symptoms dyspnea and exertion is the most common symptom usually months or even years dry cough many patients are, by the time they are diagnosed have been treated for bronchitis have been treated for asthma heart failure and the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis i was saying this is the prototype is common in the 5th and 6th decade so in slightly older people and with a male preponderance like many other things all the bad things happen to men and it is characterized by by basal inspiratory crackles in physical examination if there's one way we can catch it it is if you auscultate the bases on both sides you have very distinct crackles they are described as velcro crackles 
velcro is you know the, we have velcro in shoes uh, in bags it makes the, it makes a crrt kind of sound you know that when you open the velcro so that's the kind of sound you will hear so if you hear on both lung bases you are usually you can make a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease or ipf clubbing occurs in about 50% in this ipf okay now what is very important is a timely and accurate diagnosis as i was saying that people are usually treated for many other things one of the studies showed that 55% of patients reported consulting more than three physicians before receiving an ipf diagnosis which means that if if you uh, are aware of this and if you uh, understand this you may be able to diagnose some of these things and maybe you won't be able to manage them well you may be able to refer them to the appropriate physician ideally a respiratory physician should take care of these patients physiologic testing now measurement of lung function is crucial so what will happen to lung function so in these disorders the lung shrinks due to fibrosis so just if you want to just simply remember just remember uh, inflammation and fibrosis that's what is happening in the lung which means the lung of course it will happen in both lungs for the sake of comparison i have put a shrunk lung and a normal lung so the lung becomes like this and since it is fibrosed it is difficult to uh, inflate this lung which means you have to take more breathing effort to open this lung that's why your people patients are short of breath so this kind of disease is called a restrictive disorders when the lung cannot expand to its full disease full capacity we call it restrictive disorder and when we do lung function testing that's what we will find the second thing we will find is what is called impaired gas exchange see since there is inflammation and fibrosis when fibrosis i mean this is the part of the lung where the exchange of gases happens this is the coming into the alveolus alveolus is the very end of the uh, long bronchial tree and so when air oxygen comes inside it 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 is nicely created by god to be very wide and open having a large surface area and around it is the vascular structure you have the arterial and the venous structures all around it with a very thin membrane between them and it is while the gas comes in into this passage that the exchange happens the blood gives off its carbon dioxide and takes oxygen and then takes it to the heart and then to the rest of the body now when there is fibrosis in this area between the vessels and the and the alveolus that is called the interstitium the the part between the two things is called the interstitium so that is where fibrosis happens when that happens then the diffusion of gases from the alveolus into the vessels becomes difficult so that's what I, we mean by impaired gas exchange it is in fact called alveolar capillary block this is the alveolus where air comes this is the vascular capillaries and that uh, impairment is called alveolar capillary block now rarely uh, in some disorders some of the interstitial lung diseases there is also obstructive disease which means this is a normal airways where air can go freely in and out but look at this passage air cannot go freely now this happens in some interstitial diseases like sarcoidosis hypersensitive to pneumonitis and so on so because in addition to that fibrosis around they also have granulomas which are in the airways and these granulomas block the passage and so you can get obstructive disorder when you do lung function test so how does all this happen we do not know what the stimulus is in some situations for example in occupational disease we know what the stimulus is it is it is the occupational dust in there is something called hypersensitivity pneumonitis that is when people inhale uh, let us say pigeon uh, feathers uh, cotton and other things there also we know what is the cause but in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or ipf 
and some of the other disorders we don't know what what actually causes this lung injury something that we do not know causes the lung injury and then uh, the lung heals with fibrosis so when the lung injury happens it's an inflammatory uh, process and then when it heals it heals with fibrosis there certainly is some genetic factor that predisposes people to this lung disease again these factors are not very well understood radiology is absolutely crucial when we attempt to diagnose these disorders chest x ray patterns have to be very keenly noted now in most situations it is the clinical picture uh, including uh, history and physical examination and radiologic pattern that will help us to make the diagnosis uh, we don't have to, uh, unlike some of the rheumatologic disorders we don't have blood tests uh, we put them together you know what is it rheumatoid is it uh, systemic sclerosis so we do not know we do not have that those kind of blood biomarkers so we have to go by these patterns so in chest x ray for example we have to look at whether there's upper lobe predilection or lower lobe whether it involves more of the upper lobe or lower lobe if it is upper lobe it can be something like sarcoidosis hypersensitivity pneumonitis if it is lower lobe it can be this ipf the hero for today's talk is going to be ipf so when we talk about it without putting any specific name we are talking about ild of ipf the second thing we will want to look at is whether there is reticular pattern or alveolar opacities okay i will show you x rays then you will understand and the typical picture of ipf is bilateral reticular opacities uh, and these are more predominant in the periphery of the lung and in the lower lobes so this is an x ray now you can see what reticular can you see that this x ray has this kind of fiber kind of Thing. this is called reticular pattern so you can see this and as i described here it is pre more predominant in the lower lobe see this lower lobe right and the left lower lobe and somewhat spares the upper lobe and this is a typical pattern of the ipf and the lower lobe involvement is clear in that you can see the diaphragm is a little obscured that's because the lower lobe is involved by this fibrosis this reticular pattern usually means there is fibrosis now ct is really the key imaging modality for us and in particular we do what is called high resolution ct scan and in this we have typical patterns we have something called honeycombing which is somewhat end stage disease where there's lot of fibrosis and ground glassing which is somewhat early disease where there's alveolar inflammation when there is inflammation you have drugs which can work against inflammation when there is fibrosis we do not have any uh, i mean we do not we have very little options when fibrosis has happened it is already scarred the options are very limited so this is the uh, uh, the deal so if we can diagnose it somewhat early when there is ground glass shadow it is more amenable to treatment this is the ground glass pattern can you see this kind of spotty 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 kind of look all around the lung both sides is little more pronounced here this is called ground glass this is an inflamed lung this lung the involvement is in the form of inflammation and this will be amenable to treatment now we go to uh, the uip pattern which is the fibrosis pattern uh, in ct scan so this is a pattern which is not good Uh, the the abnormality seen a reticular abnormality then there is something called honeycombing with or without traction bronchic phases and absence of features listed as inconsistent with uip so these are the typical consistent factors if you have features which are inconsistent with it then you will think that perhaps it is not uip pattern so i want to yeah i want to show you the enlarged form of this and we can see this this round round things you see here in the lung bases are called honeycombing okay here also honeycombing basal honeycombing this is very typical of ipf 
or UIP pattern on the CT scan, which, which usually means it is a IPF. So this is also honeycombing and reticular shadows. Throughout, you can see these kind of shadows. These are all reticular shadows, all reticular shadows. And this is called traction bronchiectasis. The fibrosis around here is pulling the bronchus. So you can see a dilated bronchus here that is called traction bronchiectasis. So these are patterns which a radiologists will call it UIP, which stands for usual interstitial pneumonitis. And then if there is no cause found, we will call it IPF. So this kind of pattern should be there to call it IPF. IPF means there's a lot of fibrosis. Okay. Right. Now, apart from radiology, so it is radiology which is really the key for us. Apart from this, some of the interstitial lung disease, such as sarcoidosis, they will have granulomat mass in the lung. Some malignancies. Malignancies also can produce diffuse lung disease. Uh, so they also, so these are situations where a lung biopsy may be, a bronchoscopic lung biopsy may click the diagnosis. So this is the bronchoscope. It goes into the lung through the airways to the edge of the lung and it takes a biopsy of the lung uh, parenchyma, the lung substance, lung tissue. Now, uh, we can also take, put fluid inside and then send it, take it out and send it for cultures. Uh, we can send it for cytology. So all this can be done with a bronchoscope, but we will do it only when we suspect disorders which have granulomas or malignancy. Okay, so the American Thoracic Society, so we'll come back to the IPF, which is no cost found. It is not granuloma, it is not malignancy, it is just fibrosis. So the diagnosis of IPF requires exclusion of known causes. We should have excluded connective tissue disease, we should have excluded drug toxicity, we should have excluded occupational disease, when we exclude everything and then we find that UIP pattern, you remember I showed you that pattern with honeycombing, lot of fibrosis. When that pattern is seen, then you know it is IPF. Okay. Now, there are some situations where you have pattern of UIP and you have pattern of this ground glass shadows and things like that. So there is fibrosis, there is also uh, inflammation. So in these situations, you sometimes you may need a surgical biopsy, which means you open the do an open chest surgery, take pieces of lung, and see whether there is just fibrosis or there is also inflammation, because these two are going to be treated very differently. But open lung biopsy is very not easy, and not many patients will agree to do it. So. Uh, Easier one these days is what is called VATS biopsy. So what is VATS biopsy? The surgeons use laparoscopic instruments. They go through the chest and then they take pieces of lung like this. And that is easier, better tolerated. And in a difficult case, when you cannot make out based on all the information, radiology, clinical features, then you may resort to this. But this will be done in about less than 5% of the patients. Okay. So this is the algorithm. So first, if you have an ILD, first thing to do is you rule out all the known causes. Is there joint pains? Is there early morning stiffness? Is there, are there skin lesions? Uh, are kidney and the other organs involved? So all this you will go through. Then drug history, history of exposure, uh, mining, history of exposure to birds, farming with organic dust, all this you will explore. So if none of this is there, you do a CT scan. And then if you see this UIP pattern, which is fibrosis, then you diagnose IPF. So as I was saying that we are primarily going to talk about IPF today. Uh, if not, then it becomes complicated and sometimes you have to do biopsy. Now, often what we need is a multidisciplinary 
team meeting or discussion so we have this in our department we have radiologists when required we call rheumatologists uh, when required we call pathologists and then everybody they all we all look at all the things and finally we say it is most likely to be this disorder or most likely not this disorder more not ipf ipf so this is the final forum so in other words we are disadvantaged by the lack of a single test which will tell us whether it's ipf or not okay now how do we treat once ipf is diagnosed which means there is lot of fibrosis it is not going to respond to steroids so what will happen if you give steroids you will cause immunosuppression you will increase the risk of infections and other steroid side effects and the patient may die earlier so steroids was the treatment 20 years ago i have given lot of steroids to patients so looking back we probably like made people die little earlier than they would have died without the treatment uh, so uh, so this decision is very important that the diagnostic decision of whether it's ipf or not ipf is very important now if it is not ipf then it is one of these things nsip or non specific uh, idiopathic uh, i mean inflammatory uh, non specific disease this viscomative interstitial disease and uh, respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial disease so these are all disorders that are steroid responsive there it's not just fibrosis but they actually have inflammation so we give steroids and then we also give azathioprine cyclophosphamide and these group of drugs because they reduce the dose of steroids so treatment of ipf recommendation what should not be given is what is called triple therapy so this was done about 15 years ago 10 to 15 years ago we gave a combination of prednisolone azathioprine and n acetyl cysteine so this should not be given there is studies which show that the outcome actually is worse than placebo which means if you give this combination of drugs patients will die faster than if you don't do anything steroids no so once it is ipf once you say that there is clear cut established fibrosis and no inflammation there is no steroids in a steroid system uh, alone no so what should be given anti gastroesophageal ref- reflux treatment so many patients have gastroesophageal reflux symptoms so if they have symptoms you have to actively look for it and treat it because this is known to worsen fibrosis worsen symptoms vaccination these people are prone for infections so you could you should consider pneumococcal and flu vaccination oxygen therapy when their lung fibrosis becomes significant their oxygen levels will drop and then you could you should consider oxygen therapy and it can be given at home it's long term oxygen not not for few hours in the hospital so you have to get them to buy an oxygen concentrator and take this treatment at home then pulmonary rehabilitation see the lung is damaged but the body works as a, a big unit it works along with the heart it works with the muscles and all these put together make the person active and productive so the rehabilitation increases Uh, muscle strength it increases the cardiac function and it overall improves the patient's total performance even though the lung is damaged so this is another treatment all this should be given in addition to this now we have to treat everything with drugs so let us look at drug therapy uh, there are some drugs which have come now we said that this is fibrosis so lately in the last 10 odd years we have the anti fibrotic drugs the first among them is called pirfenidone it reduces fibroblast proliferation it inhibits tgf beta stimulated collagen production and uh, you know in nigm there's a categorical statement that pirfenidone slows disease progression in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis 
although fibrosis has already set in, it slows down the fibrosis. So this is a study. There are two major studies. They are called capacity one and two. You know, all these uh, studies, they have these uh, attractive names. Uh, so capacity one and two. So this is combination of both the studies looking at forced vital capacity. Now, the we said the lung becomes small. When the lung becomes small, the forced vital capacity becomes less. And so this study looked at what happens to the forced vital capacity uh, if the drug is given here and the drug is not given, a placebo is given. So when placebo is given, the lung function drops. FPC drops like this. This is how it drops, a green line. On the other hand, when uh, the drug was given, this is the drop. The lung function still dropped. There's no medicine to increase the lung function, but the drop slowed down considerably. So we can only slow down the decline of lung function. We cannot increase the lung function. So then they looked at a lot of endpoints. The first vital capacity, which I showed you, all that is significantly uh, improved in the people who are taking drugs. But an another uh, important outcome is is this one. That is, now the lung function may change, but if the patient doesn't get better, he does not live more. What is the point? So these were secondary endpoints in these studies and are they also better with the drug? It looks like all cause mortality, which means whatever the cause of death is, they measured the people with the drug and without the drug and found that with the drug, the mortality was less. Treatment emergent all-cause mortality and IPF-related mortality, death due to the disease, IPF, also was significantly less. So it is now clear that this drug slows down fibrosis and re reduces the decline of lung function. And most importantly, it... Uh, re it reduces mortality. Okay. Then nintidanib is a new drug, new kid in the block. In India, we have it for only the last two years or so. And only now it has become affordable. It was something like uh, 60, 70,000 rupees per month. You can imagine how many patients can afford that. Now the costs have dropped and a lot more people are going to take this drug. This is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and it works against multiple growth factors. Again, we have to see what the studies show. The study is impulses one and two. Another, these are again two short forms. And again, what did they show? The decline of lung function is slow when the drug is given as compared to placebo. In placebo, the lung function drops, drops very quickly. Same thing with the second study. Both the studies showed the same thing with regard to lung function. But the secondary endpoints, they looked at exacerbation. You know, these patients not only have gradually worsening lung function and more and more breathlessness, but they have this acute flare-up of breathlessness. They may land in the hospital suddenly getting severe breathlessness and severe, severe hypoxia. They need oxygen and... Uh, high-dose drugs, and often they end up in the intensive care unit and they don't do well when they have these exacerbations. So they found, they showed that the time to exacerbation also is, uh, is prolonged, which means they don't get exacerbation soon. They, they take more time to get exacerbation, which is also a very important endpoint because exacerbation means more death. Okay. So I have finished idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So do we have time for one or two more or are we done? If, if we can uh, stop here, I'm happy to stop uh, and take questions because- the No, sir, you can, you can continue, sir. I know, sir, you can okay. continue. Uh, then I will talk minutes, about sir. one. Yeah, I will talk about, okay, let me see how it goes. Uh, because interstitial lung disease uh, among 100, uh, maybe 200 interstitial diseases, we have only covered the main one, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. 
i am just going to touch upon the other common ones we can't you no need to know everything but you need to know the common things so the common uh, disorder another one is called sarcoidosis may give you yeah so sarcoidosis is a systemic disorder of unknown cause and it has granulomatous inflammation which means when we biopsy organs and uh, examine it there will be granuloma seen the classic the symptoms are dry cough and dyspnea and the classic picture is hilar adenopathy bilateral hilar adenopathy so when you have an x ray like this with this kind of bilateral hilar adenopathy you should think of sarcoidosis so the diagnosis is clinical radiologic and pathologic which means you have to make a diagnosis biopsy and confirm this so usually we do lung biopsy through the bronchoscope we go to the bronchoscope i showed you that with the forceps we took lung biopsy uh, and sometimes we what we do is through the bronchoscope we uh, this these nodes are here so we pierce the bronchus and come outside and pierce the nodes and take some biopsy it's called ebus we use ultrasound through the bronchoscope to guide us to get this biopsy Uh, there are some blood tests which can help in a rare situation angiotensin comfort converting converter enzyme or ace levels are elevated and the ppd which is a skin test is usually negative in these patients unlike just the opposite of tuberculosis and the treatment in these people in these patients is steroids they are very steroid responsive and so these are the good relatively good interstitial lung diseases they are more responsive to treatment pneumoconiosis these are occupational disorders uh, those who are exposed to sand kind of dust get silicosis and those who are exposed to coal may get coal workers pneumoconiosis and those who work with asbestos especially this uh, dust of asbestos can get asbestosis so these are just examples and you a good history is very very important uh, the symptoms will be very similar as i said most of the symptoms are common but it is this good history and the radiologic pattern of involvement and so on that helps us to clinch a diagnosis and then the other important thing is something called hypersensitivity pneumonitis or extrinsic allergic alveolitis these are caused by inhaled agents uh, and they can become progressive severe and even fatal end stage lung disease what are these things that it can be organic dust so the farmers may inhale certain organic molds fungal particles uh, and so on and that can cause uh, and it can happen in chemical industry due to inhalation of di isocyanides and organic acids and it can also happen in the metal industry people working with metals but more important is indoor exposures exposure to pet birds in particular pigeons so people with interstitial lung disease you should ask not just occupational but their pets do they have birds at home especially pigeons at home then humidifiers you know this humid thing allows certain fungi to grow and that can cause interstitial lung disease and whether their house has lot of indoor molds and the walls you know there's black color molds and if they are inhaling this every day they could get this disease so i have covered just given you a taste of the other disorders but we have mostly covered idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or ipf when people say ild they usually mean that so i want to conclude so to diagnose these disorders you need a high index of suspicion when people come with cough with uh, breathlessness you think of asthma you think of copd but you should also think of interstitial lung disease x ray is very important when the x ray shows these uh, reticular patterns then you should suspect interstitial lung disease and when spirometric lung function test shows restriction the lung that fec is reduced then again you can think about it and then the important thing is to order a high resolution ct scan and this will be diagnostic
and after that you know you are dealing with that disease so when there's suspicion based on all these things you have to get a hrct done giving correct treatment is crucial if you give steroids for people with established fibrosis like ipf it will expedite their death on the other hand if you don't give steroids for people with sarcoidosis hypersensitive pneumonitis that will worsen their prognosis so correct diagnosis becomes very important and then you should think of this in the setting of difficult to control asthma you keep, keep on giving inhaled drugs for many years patients are not doing well and then you have to think about this and make sure you are not missing this same thing with rapidly progressive copd uh, you should keep interstitial lung disease in mind so i think with that i am done thank you very much thanks for your patience uh, thank you sir for your outstanding presentation uh, at first i like to hear from our today's chairperson about your presentation as our chairperson expressed his uh, fascination for this subject at the beginning uh, of the lecture so now i am offering professor said atikul hok sir uh, to comment about this presentation f and uh, if sir if you want to add something you can initially add and then we have lots of questions and our question answer section is flooded with questions and also there are many questions in our live section so now i am offer, offering professor said atikul hok sir Then we'll uh, go to question and session. Thank you very much. You have put me in a great, you know, a uh, great trouble, I should say. Uh, actually, you know, it was a fantastic lecture, and uh, Dr. Professor D. J. Christopher has removed many of the dilemmas. But you know, of course, ILD is a very big chapter, so to give a talk on ILD in details within, uh, you know, I should say, how much was the time constraint? He was. he has given it for 45 minutes so giving a lecture on ild within 45 minutes is a great challenge a great challenge and naturally you know uh, he has selected a few topics for ilds and i think i would say he has very nicely presented and i think the issues that are very important whenever uh, our doctors come across patients with for example ild most in most of the cases the doctors do not differentiate between ipf nsip or this thing so uh, and very commonly prescribed prednisolone or steroid and we have today we have learned that you know there are groups of ilds in which steroids are useless they don't help at all and classically this is ipf in our case in you know in case of rheumatic conditions associated with ild we call it uh, you know uh, uip he has already clarified that you know when we know the cause that is not ipf when it is when the cause is not known then we call it ipf and when the cause is known like rheumatoid arthritis systemic sclerosis then idiopathic inflammatory myositis or uh, other rheumatic conditions uh in that case if the picture is like ipf with plenty of you know honeycomb being fibrosis and no inflammation uh, uh for such cases we usually use the word uip and for this uip without evidence of inflammation at hrct sometimes bronchial viral lavage also gives clue to uh you know uh, in presence of inflammation if there is no feature of infra or biopsy if there is no evidence of inflammation steroid or immunosuppressive drugs are useless rather they can shorten the life span of the patient that is very much important so we have to remember if we cannot treat the patient with drugs we should not kill the patient that is very much important that is called you know uh, non maleficence the principle of non maleficence is very important here because every year we doctors are hastening the death or shortly to say we doctors are killing many patients with ilds just because we don't distinguish between treatable and untreatable forms of ilds that is very important of course you know uh, in our practice in fact nsip and organizing pneumonia is also common these are more common forms so 
in these conditions, immunosuppression definitely helps. And I would expect that, you know, some of the, uh, some from the audience will ask these questions and uh, Professor Christopher will be compelled to address these issues during the question and answer session. He could not include these issues within his lecture because of the time constraint, I will understand. So, and also another issue actually, I want to learn from him regarding, you know, that is called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Actually, actually, you know, regarding interstitial lung disease, I am, I team with, uh, you know, I should say misconceptions. I have a lot of misconceptions, I should agree. And I had an impression that we should call hypersensitivity pneumonitis or extrinsic allergic alveolitis when the cause is a is an organic dust or organic particle, but for heavy metals or metals, we call it, you know, something like pneumoconiosis, but we don't call them hypersensitivity, uh, you know, uh, pneumonitis. That is, that uh, maybe I am mistaken. That is one thing. I need a clarification from Professor Christopher. And also I have another misconception that, you know, uh, I think that uh, the word ILD or DPLD is usually considered for, you know, uh, pulmonary restrictive pulmonary conditions or pulmonary parenchymal diseases uh, with slow insidious onset and slow progression. Of course, there are a few exceptions like AIP that is called acute interstitial pneumonia or, you know, acute organizing pneumonia is also another with uh, you know, comparatively rapid onset and rapid progression. So except a few conditions, these are usually slowly progressive. But uh, I wonder if among hypersensitivity pneumonitis, is there a subgroup with comparatively, uh, you know, insidious onset and slow progression? That is also one thing I am interested to know. As a whole, you know, the excellent, his delivery was excellent and the areas that he has touched. I have said that he has left untouched many issues. And if he, he decided to include all the issues related to ILD in these 45 minute lectures, we would have understood very little. So he had picked up a few issues, but he has clarified those few issues exceedingly nicely. Exceptionally nicely he has clarified those issues. So I thank uh, Professor Christopher very much. I have put my questions also to him and I think these questions will be asked by the audience and I thank you all. Thank you, uh, thank you sir, already asked about this issue. So Professor DJ Christopher sir, uh, if we start with hypersensitive pneumonitis and about query about DPLD by our chairperson sir. So I will just... So, by and far, you know, Professor is absolutely right that, you know, it is organic dust that is the cause of extrinsic allergic alveolitis or hypersensitive pneumonitis. But there are certain chemicals which also initiate the same kind of uh, immune reaction in the lung and cause the same pattern of involvement. That includes some uh, uh, heavy, uh, heavy metal exposures. Uh, I mean, uh, chemical exposure, sorry. So heavy chemical exposure, that's what it means. It's not heavy metal, it's heavy chemical exposure. But the yes, common common uh, uh, culprits are these things, pet birds. Now, there is a theory about air coolers. I very thought much about it and didn't mention it. But there is a, a th theory that, you know, perhaps that humid situation inside can cause fungi to grow and then that can increase the chance of this. So if you have a air cooler, then make sure that it is periodically washed, allowed to dry fully so that fungi cannot grow. Uh, Professor, have I, finished, have I addressed your questions or is there anything I left? Uh, you know, uh, can it be, can hypersensitivity pneumonitis be, you know, of Insidious onset and slow progression, yeah. like classic yeah. uh, ILDs. Yes, uh, insidious, yes, but uh, usually it occurs over months. But if you look at IPFs, 
sometimes it presents over years patients have had 3 years of breathlessness sometimes so uh, this occurs usually over months but the but the rapidity it is it is very much like rheumatological disorder there is a variation in you know the speed of things uh, but by and far they occur over months so 3 months 4 months 2 months uh, that's the kind of uh, typical uh, duration of symptoms when patients come to us okay thank you uh, thank you sir and now we are going to start our uh, question answer session a uh, first question for uh, professor dj christopher sir by dr mahmud ul hasan dr mahmud hasan uh, sir uh, what is the age relation um, about ild and what are the common drugs that may cause ild so there are so many drugs so chemotherapeutic agents are by and far the most uh, you know best known you know bleomycin and then uh, drugs such as cyclophosphamide methotrexate uh these are all uh, relatively common because they are commonly used but the the drugs that can cause is a very long list i'll see if i can pull it up it's a very long list and so many drugs uh, have rarely caused uh, uh, involvement but i think the common okay let me try it so the common ones are so nitrofurantoin you know we don't use it much but when they used it that was one of the causes uh, then we have uh, procainamide isoniazid oxygen you know oxygen when it is used in high concentrations for a long time can cause lung fibrosis uh, radiation so there are so many causes but i would say that uh, methotrexate azathioprine cyclophosphamide busulfan bleomycin are probably the drugs that we encounter more often in practice because these are used now in these days uh, more commonly than some of the other drugs uh thank you sir now i have a question uh, for uh, for uh, professor said atik lok sir sir we know both rheumatoid arthritis and methotrexate uh, uh both rheumatoid arthritis uh, sir question i'm i'm asking again uh, sir both rheumatoid arthritis and mtx are known uh, cause of ild how can we prevent ild in rheumatoid arthritis patient taking methotrexate or what precaution this patient should take uh, thank you very much in fact you know uh, in the past it was thought that methotrexate is a common cause of ild in uh, in whatever patients maybe but uh, you know in a in a few recent long term follow up study it has been found that the incidence of uh, you know ild is not significantly higher in rheumatoid arthritis patients treated with methotrexate compared to rheumatoid arthritis patient treated with other agents so nowadays it is it is thought that you know ild caused by uh, methotrexate is extremely rare and for the uh, you know for the treatment of you know for using uh, methotrexate for the treatment of ild for rheumatoid arthritis we should not be at all concerned it has got great benefit it is still now this is the even after discovery of Uh, a good number of discovery and approval of a good number of biologics methotrexate is still the first line treatment for uh, you know rheumatoid arthritis considering its efficacy safety as well as uh, you know pharmacoeconomic viewpoint so methotrexate is now it is said that you know methotrexate rarely may cause acute alveolitis but dpld is very rare and this is number 1 number 2 in the past we used to be afraid to use methotrexate in a rheumatoid arthritis patient with ild uh, with the you know with an apprehension that methotrexate may worsen the pre existing lung disease now this is also you know there are some studies that this is also not true moreover methotrexate is found to be useful in the treatment of some forms of ild for example sarcoid ild if steroid is not enough 
then or if we need higher dose of steroid long term steroid or more than 10 to 15 mg of steroid for maintenance of remission in that case you know the use of methotrexate is rather encouraged for this moreover there are some reports that methotrexate useful in the methotrexate helps you know uh, also in the treatment of ild associated with rheumatoid arthritis so we can say in fact you know methotrexate we should not be afraid of using methotrexate for ild that is number 1 number 2 in patients actually you know uh, in patients those who have moderate to severe lung disease we should look for alternative we should not use methotrexate we should rather use other things and uh, and i think these are the this is these are the only precautions that we can take and of course so another you know, question regarding with this. ckd and hypoalbuminemia the incidence of alveolitis is a bit higher so if a patient becomes hypoalbuminemic or the creatinine increases in that case also we should restrict the use of methotrexate okay then okay please continue sir another, um, sir, another question regarding sir sir how we can differentiate ild of rheumatoid arthritis itself or it's due to effect of mtx actually the same thing applies you know when a rheumatoid arthritis patient develops ild we have to consider that this is due to uh, this is due to rheumatoid arthritis and not due to methotrexate but of course you know i said that methotrexate may sometimes cause acute alveolitis and in that case the best thing is a stop we should stop methotrexate and if the patient improves after stopping methotrexate we may consider that methotrexate may be responsible and for this there is one you know one scoring system is also there and uh, and we can repeat this hrct after two months if hrct clears after two months of stopping methotrexate you know we can be tentatively sure that this was methotrexate induced alveolitis i say tentative because you know there are other causes of acute alveolitis also suppose a patient of rheumatoid arthritis is getting uh, you know methotrexate if he develops acute alveolitis we cannot accuse solely this you know uh, this methotrexate because these patients are also vulnerable to infections and there are viral infections which may cause alveolitis so infection is also a common mimic so we cannot be sure but we can guess that yes this may be methotrexate in real alveolitis and in those patients we should avoid using methotrexate in future i uh, thank course, you sir you know, i would i would uh, invite professor christopher uh, to supplement my replies in this connection also i think you have put a very difficult problem very nicely you have addressed it very nicely i think so the first point i just in the interest of time i'll make two just two points the first is that methotrexate is so valuable in rheumatoid arthritis so we should never fear using the drug because the benefits are overwhelming now if patient develops interstitial disease and you have fear about this at that time you could consider withdrawing it and seeing whether that is making a dramatic response uh, so i think this is the two ways to look at it although there is no one correct response but i think this is the best way to balance the two things thank you ah uh, uh, thank you sir now question from dr juthi dash to professor dj christopher sir sir why clubbing occurs in interstitial lung disease first question and there is another question from mahmudul hasan as general practitioner should we treat interstitial lung disease if so then up to which extent we shall okay the first question why clubbing happens uh, i think is a uh, you know there are several theories of clubbing uh, why it happens and it doesn't happen only in uh, interstitial disease it happens in bronchial disease it happens in lung cancer so suffice it to say i think rather than go into that which is a separate topic in itself that if you have a patient with interstitial lung disease who has clubbing the chance of them having idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is high compared to some of the other things so it really helps to put the overall pattern and picture together and make a diagnosis i think that is enough to know 
so in terms of whether general practitioner can manage uh, i would uh, advise a lot of caution here because even for us diagnosing interstitial lung disease and you know anybody can diagnose interstitial lung disease. well not anybody but uh, so you you may be able to diagnose it but to be able to differentiate the eat the type of interstitial lung disease uh, to to be able to distinguish fibrosing interstitial disease from the uh, inflammatory interstitial lung disease all this is a uh, is very challenging and then next uh, to give immunosuppressive drugs to give steroids to give anti fibrotic drugs it would be better off under someone with experience it is the same scenario with rheumatologic disease can i treat rheumatoid arthritis i definitely can use all those drugs but will my treatment be as effective as professor ati atikul haq no it won't be it requires a certain experience it requires a lot of balancing there's no this it's not like five day antibiotic course bd for 5 days anybody can dispense but treatment of these disorders is judiciously balanced based on clinical improvement lung function improvement radiologic improvement and so this can be challenging at the general practice level so i would say it it requires a respiratory physician to treat interstitial lung disease having said that they may come to you for follow up you know they may come to you in between with some uh, infective exacerbation you you will be involved in this but you will not be uh, directing the overall course of treatment uh thank you sir now questions for uh, professor atikulak sir sir what is best screening test to diagnose ild in our context what are test we should do while suspect ild in bangladesh in our context uh- Okay, thank you very much. You know, I think for this also, Professor Christopher is more so better, uh, more competent for me. But even then, you know, I can try. I would say that you know, for ILD, we should take a very careful history. That is very much important, and you know, particularly uh, exertional shortness of breath and increasing, progressively increasing breathlessness. Uh, this is an important criterion, symptomatic, and then also cough, dry cough is also another important point, and then. we have to examine the patient particularly for clubbing and also by basal velco crepes as uh, professor christopher has said and if we get these things then we have to go for high resolution ct scan that is very ct scan is very much important and he has said already made it clear that without ct scan uh, you know we should not proceed to treating uh, ilds and also you know in our uh, actually we are sometimes actually in all patients basically uh, in the next we have to do spirometry with uh, you know that is spir with dlco that is also very important as a baseline you know to assess monitor the progression and if we decide to treat the patient to assess the effect of treatment also these are important so i think these are the things but you know we have to we have to be very careful that you know what is the cause of this ild as professor christopher has repeatedly reemphasized that it has got multiple causes he said it has got approximately 200 causes or types so we have to be sure what is the cause of this ild sometimes you know we may treat some infective chronic infective ild also with immunosuppressive drugs and may hasten the process of death so we have to be very sure that this treatment is the most appropriate treatment for this particular patient and it's it's very much challenging i i don't dare i don't dare to do, do this you know uh, thank you sir as a moderator uh, today i'm passing really tough time <laughs> i'm like so many questions i'm really confused <laughs> what to do what not to do The next question from uh, Dr. Maksud Aki. Uh, she is a prominent prominent dermatologist. Sir, her first question to Professor D J Christopher, sir. Sir, what is the indication for surgical lung biopsy for patient in whom physician suspect interstitial lung disease? And last, and another question for you: Is there any role of plasmapheresis? The 
the second one again you have a lot of questions so i am going to be rapid fire answers so plasma fluoros is no yes sir okay so with regard to when we do surgical lung biopsy uh, see the diagnosis is based on the pattern pattern of symptoms pattern of exam- physical findings then the radiologic pattern uh, all put together we make a diagnosis so if we are not able to make a diagnosis and we are caught between i don't know if it's a fibrotic fibrosing lung disease versus uh, inflammatory lung disease uh, or cellular lung disease that's what these are some terms that are used when we are caught in that dilemma that is the only time we think of lung biopsy so if it is clearly ground glass shadows which means it is a inflammatory pathology and if it is uh, uh, uip which is fibrosis that is uh, fibrosing pathology both can be separated out usually on the basis of uh, clinical features and radiology when you cannot do it the ones that come right in the middle and you don't know whether to go this way or that way that's the only situation you do lung biopsy uh, thank you sir uh, har other two question uh, for professor said atikulak sir sir what is the prognosis of systemic sclerosis patient with ild next one what should be management in special condition like pregnancy with pss and ild okay thank you very much in fact you know uh, the first question was what is the sorry Uh, sir, what is the prognosis of systemic sclerosis patient with okay, ILD? Thank you, thank, thank you very much. As a whole, you know, uh, prognosis of uh, connective tissue disease associated ILDs is better than idiopathic forms. Uh, it is. It has been observed that you know, in patients with systemic sclerosis, it progresses to some extent and then stops. It doesn't progress anymore. that is one good thing it is not relentlessly progressive in all patients and and then number two issue is that you know there is also a spontaneous resolution even without treatment in some patients it resolves and also uh, you know actually for systemic sclerosis associated ild we follow certain characteristics for initiating treatment firstly we have to say what is the percentage of ground glass if the ground glass opacity is you know Uh, occupies more than 20% of the lung fields then we start immunosuppressive therapy if it is less than 20% we don't give it and also dlco dlco particularly you know that is one alveolar uh, distribution type i forgot the exact word for this if dlco is uh, re- you know reduced by more than 30% also we start the treatment immediately but uh, if uh it is uh, normal or if it is not uh, you know reduced by that percentage then we follow up the patient after 6 month again we repeat hrct and then we also you know this spirometry dlco if we find that there is progression of the condition we start immunosuppressive therapy at that time and actually you know uh, during pregnancy we give a steroid and I, i have said that for systemic sclerosis associated ild the dose of steroid is smaller i think the questioner knows that you know uh, systemic sclerosis if we give a steroid in high dose it may increase the risk of scleroderma renal crisis and that's why the dose for systemic sclerosis associated ILD the dose of prednisolone is 10 mg daily or 20 mg every alternate day in very aggressive cases we use 0.5 mg per kg but not more than that and this amount of prednisolone may be given in pregnancy also that is there is no bar regarding you know selection of the glucocorticoid sparing agents azathioprine is again safe in pregnancy we won't do cyclophosphamide we have to avoid cyclophosphamide mycophenol mofetil these things but you know the other option as a thyroprin can be safely given during pregnancy if a patient with systemic sclerosis definitely requires immunosuppressive therapy then as as a thyroprin is a pregnancy friendly glucocorticoid sparing 
immunosuppressive and we can easily give it. So it is not that much difficult. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, now our next question is for Professor DJ Christopher, sir. Sir, as this is COVID era, so we have some related questions about COVID also. Sir, okay, first may, question, may sir, I, what is may, the difference uh, between... Just I am requesting, Christopher, whenever you are giving answers to questions placed to you, if you find that, you know, in my reply, there was some mistake, some error, or some incompleteness, you have, you know, absolute liberty because, you know, I have agreed to chair this session just to learn from you. Yeah, but all your responses, I had nothing to add because you did such a good job. That's why I didn't even bother to come in. You're doing a great job. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so for this. Sir, I'm personally feeling honored to be part with this great session with two living legend. Uh, sir, next question. Sir, uh, what COVID. is difference between fibrosis of COVID and fibrosis of ILD? First, can we give pyrfinadine in COVID fibrosis? Second, Last question, which is million dollar question. Sir, when you advise to do HRCT in a patient of COVID or suspected COVID? Three question. Okay. So it's a very COVID centered question and I don't blame, uh, <laughs> is it a he or she? Uh, her or him for asking this question. He. He, he, okay. So these are and burning also questions. Also our Professor Sohid Atikulak sir has got Yes, sir. Burning questions. Okay. Difficult uh, questions. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, how is it different? So now, thankfully, COVID doesn't always cause fibrosis. Uh, although there are radiologic shadows in a lot of people, you know, nearly 80, more than 80% of the people will have radiologic abnormalities with COVID even though they are sitting at home with normal oxygen. If you do a CT scan, you will pick up shadows on most of the patients. Even so, over the over weeks and months, by three months, most of the people, most of the shadows have disappeared. So that is the good thing about COVID. Having said that, yesterday I gave a talk on post-COVID fibrosis. So we, people are encountering, and we are also encountering people with who are coming back with breathlessness, and then we find that they have lung fibrosis. Uh, it is in some ways, uh, well, it can be one kind of interstitial lung disease. Uh, it, it behaves in similar ways. Uh, now, how it is different, the IPF is a very basal predominant uh, pathology. And this not necessarily is basal. Uh, so, so these are little different. So I'm, I don't think we will have difficulty in distinguishing them because this will happen in the aftermath of COVID. So we may not have difficulty. Now the question of about HRCT, when it should be done in COVID patients, uh, unless patients are acutely unwell, not responding to treatment, you suspect pulmonary thromboembolism, don't go on doing CT scans. Not many decisions are based on CT scan. Thromboembolism, yes. But the other decisions are not based on CT scan. They are based on hypoxia. Uh, they are based on uh, the magnitude of symptoms and so on. So when do we check for Resolution of COVID. So that is probably the he hidden intent in that question. So don't, definitely don't do CT scan for three months. If you really want to know about fibrosis, residual fibrosis, we should look at it only after three months. And that too, I think it's only in people who are symptomatic, we should do uh, since up to three months, they can have shadows and it is not abnormal. If they are severely, I mean, if they are significantly symptomatic, as assessment of that, you will do CT scan. Not to look at whether COVID uh, has cleared. 
So I hope I have answered the question. Uh, Professor Sir, do you want to add something? As all of we know, you have got very special interest on COVID. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, you know, I, uh, he has uh, answered it completely. So I don't have anything to add, but I can ask one question to Professor Christopher. It is a supplementary question. Uh, you know, uh, can we do CT scan in a patient who has symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 but both RT-PCR and antigen test are negative. So you could not confirm it. In that case, just for confirmation, can we do CT scan to see whether there is typical COVID pattern of, uh, you know, CT shadowing? Yeah. Can, can it constitute one indication? Yeah, if it we can miss, constitute. Yeah, yeah. If, if we miss the laboratory done, diagnosis, laboratory confirmation. Correct. Yeah, if you have done... RT-PCR and it is negative, but you suspected very strongly it was COVID, you still suspect it is COVID, then there's no harm in doing a CT scan. It, it may substantiate your... Now, RT-PCR was not 100% sensitive. We have to understand that. So you can make a case for doing and then saying that based on this COVID negative, but I'm going to isolate this patient. I'm going to treat this patient like COVID. So for that, you may use CT scan. But, uh, and you know, it's interesting that you ask this question because they, they used it extensively in China. Uh, when the patient comes in, they push them into the CT room and did a CT first. The reason for that is different. Their, R, their PCR was not RT. Their PCR took several days, uh, three, five days, sometimes one week to get the result. So they needed a quick test to, uh, you know, diagnose and uh, triage them into the COVID areas. So they use CT scan a lot. But today our COVID tests come very quickly. We do three rounds of testing every day in CMC. So in hours, we get the results. And then today gene export is available, which will give you a report within two to three hours. So, uh, for the speed, we don't have to do, but when it is negative by RT-PCR and you still suspect COVID, I think there is a case to do it. In our country, you know, uh, Professor Christopher, the uh, one big problem is that, you know, people, even including doctors, hesitate to go for testing. And, you know, the test is actually, uh, you know, the positive in highest proportion of patients during the first one or two days, two to three days. After five days, it becomes negative in a proportion. After seven days, even more. And the people goes for testing, usually five to seven days after the onset of symptoms. And thus, you know, these tests become negative. That is also one cause of, one common cause of, you know, false negative RT-PCR in our country. Yeah. Uh, well, in our country also, patients now increasingly don't go for testing. They... Yeah manage as long as possible when they think things are not going well then they come to the hospital yeah 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 sir just another question sir though it's not related to today's subject sir in india are you taking hydroxychloroquine as prophylactic no we don't take okay no. sir chloroquine okay, has sir. been proved sir. proved to be not useful for treatment and also not useful for prophylaxis. So early in the in the pandemic, there was uh, hope that chloroquine will work. But as the results of randomized control trials came out, uh, we now know that COVID does not have any role in treatment of patients. And prophylaxis, there's no, as of now, there's no study to support it also in prophylaxis. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so now a scenario based question uh, to both of you. Uh, to Professor Atik, sir, and Professor Christopher, sir, a known case, limited systemic sclerosis patient with DPLD and pulmonary hypertension become unplanned pregnant 12 weeks. Disease is inactive. Now, PSP 20 milligram with tadalafil. HRCT more than 30% lung involvement. Currently treated with nifedipine, ecospin. 
my question what will be advice uh, uh, the patient regarding pregnancy issues and treatment of dpld now at first professor sudatik sir then uh, professor dj christopher sir i think it's better to take the opinion of christopher first i think then... i will take your opinion because okay. uh, i i would go very easy on the lung i'll tell you why i, I think your treatment is more important here yeah. okay you know in that case you know if it is uh, you know this uh, ground loss opacities if they occupy more than 30% in that case we have to treat you know this ild with prednisolone depending upon his upon her weight and aggressiveness of the overall condition we can give either 10 mg daily or 0.5 mg per kg and uh, and you know that is one thing for uh, for uh, you know this ild for ild we can also start with azathioprine starting with low dose and gradually we can increase for pregnancy it is said that up to 2 mg per kg is safe during pregnancy so we can do that one for actually you know for uh, this uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension pulmonary hypertension is associated with poor pregnancy outcomes actually maternal death is very common in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension so if the pulmonary pressure is very high say systolic pressure is more than 90 mm of mercury in that case it is advisable to terminate the pregnancy because in that case you know the mother's life becomes more important to us but if it is less than that you know and in that case we have to use you know this uh, tadalafil we have to increase the dose of tadalafil at 6 weeks intervals and also if the pressure is not controlled we have to add Uh, you know some uh, phosphodiesterase endothelin sorry endothelin one receptor blocker like uh, embrisan M- embrisentan is the cheapest one in our country we can use that one also yeah i i completely agree with you so if the lung involvement was not uh, much less than what was said we would have just allowed the pregnancy to complete and then act but if it is significant i think the mother's outlook outcome is more important i would do exactly what professor atikul hak said uh, thank you sir sir as all the good things has to come to an end uh, i will take last two question uh, from dr maisam uh, subahan his question is sir we see pirfenadine and uh nintadanib are two main uh are two main drugs in the treatment of dpld how to start these drugs dose can these two drugs be given together and how long we shall continue this two drug so uh each both these drugs as we speak uh we have to now think that they are equally effective there are no head to head studies comparing these two drugs so which one is better that there's no answer to that question so you can take both now uh, pirfenadone unfortunately has a very high dose the almost the minimum effective dose is something like 1800 mg Uh, so 200 mg tablet three tablets three tablets size daily yes yes yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, very often we go to up to 2.4 grams if they tolerate 1800 we keep going and uh, even up to 2.4 grams so it is not a very pleasurable thing to take in terms of the sheer quantity of tablet in that sense nintidanib has uh you know i think it's 150 bd so it's a smaller dose easy to take uh easy to handle in that sense but both have their own side effects the nintidanib has a lot of gi side effects and uh, pirfenadone has skin side effects more it may also have gi side effects in fact uh, we did one study one of our post graduates did as thesis we found that the Uh, number one side effects in nintidanib also uh, in pirfenadone also was gi not skin uh, we it's we behave very differently from the western population 
so we don't have so much skin side effects with perfenolone very very few patients had skin side effects of course we give them instructions to cover their skin wear full sleeves and so on but only few patients have reported skin side effects so you will also go by the tolerance of the drugs and take it how long to take it well i suppose as long as they live and as long as they can tolerate so tolerance will become a important factor if they they are not tolerating and their quality of life is uh, getting worse by taking the drug they have to stop it but if they are tolerating the drug and if, if things are going well we should keep continuing there is no answer to what will happen in 4 years we don't or 5 years with nintidanib with perfenolone there's a trial that has done 4 or 5 years follow up but nintidanib we don't we don't know so we have to keep continuing as long as things go well okay may i uh, supplement so, yeah. or uh, you know actually firstly i would request the question uh, uh, questioner you know to be a bit more cautious about asking the question because he said that uh, perfenidone is effective in, in ilds this statement is not wholly correct because as professor christopher said you know ilds have got many types and perfenidone is effective in ipf not in most of the other varieties you know it is said that perfenidone may also be used in some other forms of predominantly fibrotic form of uh, ilds but not in predominantly inflammatory forms that is one thing so i am putting this uh, caution just because i am sure that someone will catch his question and we will start prescribing perfenidone in all patients with ild so we cannot be non selective we have to be selective for mm. selecting perfenidone and nintanilab that is number one number two perfenidone and nintanilab they are usually uh, recommended for ipf not for connective tissue disease associated ilds for connective tissue disease associated ilds the you know the experience is more recent actually uh, there are a few publications of efficacy reports of efficacy which have been published very recently so and also they are found to be less effective than in ipf uh, in in uip in uip they are less effective uh, that is number 2 you have to remember so we should not be indiscriminate in case of uip it is said that they are effective in mild to moderate restrictive lung disease not in severely restrictive for example if the fvc is less than 50% we should not use perfenidone or nintanilab because we know that this will not work that is one uh, you know regarding our uip that uh, you know connective tissue disease associated and for connective tissue disease associated uip it is also said of course i i would say uh, you know the audience that you know you have to remember that with connective tissue disease associated uh, ild nsip is more common and there is also organizing pneumonia or op is also one of the common form uip is not not the commonest form that is one thing but if we find that this patient has got definite uip with hrct then we can give perfenidone or nitidinib and it is said that if if bc uh, decreases by 10% or more at the end of 12 months we should stop considering that these drugs are not working uh, these are the three important points and also there is one interesting report of in enhanced efficacy with combination of perfenidone plus nintidanib in rheumatoid arthritis associated ild uh, but rheumatoid i would say rather more exactly rheumatoid arthritis associated uip okay and uh, may i ask okay at the end may i ask one question to uh, professor christopher esan of course esan do you do you allow me sure sir eh? moderator okay actually you know as uh, your chair person you have all the authority <laughs> but of course you know uh, uh, professor christopher uh, as you have also said that you know in inflammatory forms of ilds your choice is also straight cyclophosphamide and azathioprine but i often say see that you know uh, when our patients with ilds go to cmc 
they often come back with mycophenolic mofetil it seems that you know you have got a preference for mycophenolic mofetil to you know uh, to as a therapy not cyclophosphamide can you explain me why uh, uh okay. our default is not mycophenolic but we have uh, in in some patients we have used mycophenolic Uh, obviously you know that it is it is more better tolerated and probably has lesser side effects yeah uh, but what i do not know is whether we have uh, studies in mycophenolate uh, in in all the ilds so if we have used it in certain ild it means that in that ild there is some evidence that it works in some so when it works it could be safer than cyclophosphamide but if there's no evidence of use in that condition we won't use it yeah okay thank you very much yeah uh thank you very much sir sir last question uh, for professor sudati kolak sir why it is uh, sir, the speaker, question uh, from the last question should was... be to the speaker not to the chairperson <laughs> okay no, okay sir, sir, sir okay now, you now know you that our protocol uh, yeah. sir you okay. know even dj sir also knows Uh, he also faced the same problem we ask more question to our chair person <laughs> okay no problem please this is different platform sir okay, okay sir last question uh, from dr salauddin uh, his question is sir why an ankylosing spondylitis cause upper lobe fibrosis while all other connective tissue disease affect lower lobe is there any drug dose relationship uh, with fibrosis last Uh, how much mtx or amijorin is necessary to cause ild in fact you know for as i have said then for mtx actually the this is now highly debated issue whether it causes ild or not at all that is one so uh, we cannot exactly say this you know we can say that you know it is for in psoriasis patients or psoriatic arthritis patient it is said that Uh, 5 gram a cumulative dose of 5 gram is necessary for hepatic fibrosis but you know for pulmonary fibrosis i have not come across any such you know uh, relation with dose cumulative dose of methotrexate and also regarding affection of upper lobe or apical segment in ankylosing spondylitis i don't know the answer if professor christopher knows i think i, I also don't that. know the answer so we okay. know that this, this disease have predilection for certain part of the lung yeah, but yeah. i don't think we know why that is the case why in the upper lobe yeah, yeah. and uh, what was the other third question is it uh, what was the third that question, question? I, i just have to look sir okay 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 sir uh, sir so uh, another question which i must has to ask uh, to professor dj christopher sir on public demand sir question is if a patient develops diarrhea due to pyrphenidone can we continue it but main part is that what about use of pyrphenidine in covid okay uh, i will take the second one in the interest of time uh so people have hypothesized a few things about covid lung fibrosis so you know this covid lung fibrosis is uh, even 6 months ago uh, pulmonologists and people have been talking about it and we also were thinking about it so we all knew that uh, even if a small fraction of patients develop fibrosis because of the huge number of covid patients this will become a substantial burden of chronic lung disease so we have been watching this carefully and so we have also been thinking therefore how do we treat these patients and uh, people have said that uh, probably antifibrotic should be the way to go now so that's where we stand now as we speak there are at least four or five trials and we have also applied to do a trial comparing the role of antifibrotics in these patients a randomized trial so as we speak there is not a single trial that has been published that shows that using this reduces fibrosis we don't know when to start also 
because people keep improving we went through all these dilemmas people keep improving up to 3 months so at what point do you start if you see lung shadows in one month and start you will start on 50 to 60% of covid patients but isn't that an overkill when most of them will clear all shadows in 3 months so as we speak there is no evidence for use of any of these drugs on covid patients so you know christopher can we conclude that you know we should not prescribe these drugs outside clinical trial if there is a clinical trial with this we can do but outside clinical trials we should not prescribe the, i think that will be good scientific practice you know we cannot extrapolate the benefits we see with ipf into covid we cannot even do that to ctd ild now it so happens that uh, systemic sclerosis there are trial studies there are studies with, and probably rheumatoid also yeah. and antifibrotics have some role preliminary results but antifibrotics are new not used for uh, pneumoconiosis antifibrotics are not used yeah. for pulmonary tb fibrosis yeah obviously yeah. each fibrosis is different and everything you know one one size doesn't fit all so i would say that it is better to wait for evidence and now what what can we give for these patients we can give them rehabilitation that has been shown to be very effective rehabilitation uh, and uh, diet and of course if patients are hypoxic we should give them oxygen so these are and uh, all these are what we can give but we sh- we cannot as we speak with evidence prescribe antifibrotic Uh, thank you sir now we are almost uh, come to an end uh, it's our uh, first uh, uh, as a speaker it's your first presentation with us professor dj christopher sir and hope and wish that it will continue now sir do you want to give any conclusion speech or any conclusion remark about our today's presentation about question about uh, participation then our chairperson will close the session Yeah, uh, well i didn't want to say anything but i'm really very impressed by the interest and the amount of questions that came and you know i i talk quite a bit and by the quality of questions that come you can see how involved the audience is so i have a very positive sense of the audience and their comprehension of the lecture and the issues so keep it up uh, bd physicians you're doing well thank you sir basically we could not take one third of questions due to time constraint uh, now it's a time to conclusion on behalf of bd physicians and our sponsor company sk pharmaceuticals we like to invite our chairperson professor atikul hak sir to conclude the session okay thank you very much uh, you know today there is uh, no uh, vote of thanks from the sponsor isn't it yes sir okay okay thank you very much you know i would say that the session has been quite lively and very much useful to all of us and uh, i would uh, i would rather suggest uh, professor christopher you know a bit of suggestions to arrange another actually in fact you know our one great limitation is that you know we have got very few respiratory physicians in the country if we estimate you know the need for uh you know the respiratory physicians in our country it must be at least 4000 but in our country possibly there is only up to 100 or maybe 150 respiratory physicians so you can say you know uh, there is not enough experts for taking the whole burden of the entire population of ilds in our country so i think in our country we have to empower our general practitioners and internist to treat ild at least you know uh, some less uh, less complicated forms of ild so a lecture on how to differentiate among different types 
you know, uh, that will be, uh, and not lecture, actually a workshop, because it will also comprise uh, a few lectures, like, you know, clinically, how can we differentiate with history? How can we differentiate with examination? How can we dif differentiate with investigation? What should we do? So there are multiple segments. So if BD physicians can organize such a workshop on ILDs in future, that will focus only on diagnosis, not on treatment at all. It will not touch. And if individual uh, practitioners, like general practitioners or internists can eventually be empowered, the empowerment means delivery of knowledge. That is very much important. If some of them can be empowered, they can share the burden of respiratory physicians and can, you know, uh, can make the treatment more accessible to the patients. So I think you can, sometime you can arrange this. Of course, you know, we have to, I mean, our GPs and internists will have to feel courage that yes, I can undertake. It's a matter of, you know, uh, it's a matter of great dilemma whether they will feel encouraged. That is important. So that is uh, my one suggestion. And I would uh, thank BD physicians for uh, arranging this uh, webinar. That was very important for me. I have also learned and I am sure uh, the most of the audience also learned a lot from uh, Professor Christopher's lecture. And I, I also thank SK for sponsoring this event. And finally, I thank Christopher for being very diligent in his work, for dedicating, for preparing his talk with utmost care so that, you know, uh, with this talk, he may benefit the audience that audience range from general practitioners to throw internist and finally to respiratory physicians. I think there are some respiratory physicians also in the audience. And so I thank Professor Christopher from the core of my heart. And I feel really indebted to you. Thank you very much. And I hereby I close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. SK, uh, please close the live. Just please close the live, then we can talk one or two minutes, then we shall uh, leave. Live close, I say. SKF? This is a live close. Okay, thank you. Uh, sir, Christopher, sir, so, uh, which one is next from you? <laughs>